been discussing the prodigal son or the unprodigal father or however you want to look at it, but we've been in Luke 15 and considering the story there. Um, and I began the last class with this same statement that the father has a particular view of his son that he wants formed in us. Okay. Now, now, now put that in context of um, American Christianity. Is that... Do you think for one minute that American Christianity is the formation of the son in the church the way that he desired from the beginning? Probably not. We'll just, we'll just be sweet. Um, okay, that's not an attack on American Christianity or any version. Um, but it is a... Um, I hope that we will consider, we will weigh the things, we will weigh, you know, buildings and services and singing and trying and all this stuff in light of Christ being formed in us. Okay? And when we do that, we begin to realize that the Father, when he, when, when he came up with this desire for his son to be formed in us. And, and he had a particular view of what that meant, which probably isn't ours because he's eternal. When he came up with that, he, there were no buildings or hymn books or you know, all of that. He wasn't thinking, I know what'll do it, hymn books. You know, or you know, some of the things that we think you know, are integral parts of our walk with the Lord um, what we need is the Holy Spirit uh, what the, what's in the Father's heart has nothing to do with those kind of things at all it has nothing to do with that he can, do, he can do his purpose in a hog pen you know you know, when we're, when we're going, well, the one in the hog pen, they're the bad ones, and us in the building, we're the good ones. Okay, elder sons, just back off there, Skippy. And consider not your view of yourself. I'm, I'm thinking of the elder son now. Not your view of yourself, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> but his view of the son and that son formed in each and every person so that it is not so much Christianity as much as it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that, that phrase didn't come, I mean, Paul wrote it, but it didn't come from Paul. It came from the heart of the Father. And so there's a, a, um, a transition and we want to talk about that transition some tonight. A transition for those that will make that. From, from everything that we've learned to everything that the Father wants to communicate to us of his son. To, to, to change from just all of the, you know, and that doesn't mean that everything we've learned is not of God. <clears throat> but maybe we'd be a little more surprised than if we knew how much was because he's it's to him it's about his son it you know and and uh, you know the father had this before the foundation of the world so it's it's the you know he was before all things and he needs to be before all things in our life John described it best in John 1 1, that which was, or 1 John 1 1, that which was from the beginning. That's what we touched. We didn't just touch a guy that was of God, or we literally touched that which was from the beginning, from the very heart of God. And, and, and quite frankly, 
That's what we need to touch. And when we do, we won't, you know, I mean, we, well, when we do, the Spirit of God will jump on that. All right. So, uh, Luke 15, let's just read verse 23, 22. And he arose and came to his father, and when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy side, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best. Okay. Bring forth the best. Bring forth the best. The best. Okay, so you'll notice verse 20 begins with, and he arose. To get to this place in the Father's heart, you're going to have to get up. You're going to have to leave something. You're going to have to head for the Father's heart. He headed for the Father's house, and thank God the Father's there, and therefore the Father's heart is. But how much better would it be if we already just put it in our hearts that the Son, that, I mean, who can describe a Son better than a Father? You know, the Father knows the Son better than any of us, certainly better than me. I would recommend if you have the choice between going to the Father and getting his version and coming to me and mine, I suggest you go to him. You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. That's good advice. Um, but he got up. He arose. He got up. And he left where he was at. And he made his way to the heart of the Father. He headed straight for the Father, okay? And then verse 20 says, uh, he saw a, a great way off, his Father saw him. A great way off. You see, the Father sees, the Father always sees his Son. There's no point where he is not focused on his Son. And so um, it says that also in verse 20, and he ran. He ran. He ran. Um, we're in, nice to have you here. We're in um, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. And, uh, and I'm reading, so if you don't have a Bible, you're good. Um, and it says there that, that the father saw the prodigal son a great way off, but it really doesn't say he saw the prodigal son. It says his son, yeah, the son. And so he sees the son, the father, our heavenly father. He fathered, as it were, his son, and he wants to father us because Jesus, when he died and rose again, says, I go unto my father and unto your father. He didn't want us just to be saved and call that um, being fathered. It's being birthed. And the father ran when he saw the son. He ran. The father did. Not the son. The father ran to the son because he saw him. And, you know, there's sometimes people say, well, I'm trying to get hold of God. I want to get hold of God. How can I get hold of God? I can't seem to get hold of God. Well, the father, it's not his fault because he's ready to run if it's the son. If Christ is the son of God, if we are being conformed to the image of his son, and that's the, that's the wording in Romans 8, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. His son. If that's the case, if that's really the case, then our goal is not to learn all of the ins and outs of Christianity. Our goal is to learn the son of the father's love, of the father's heart, of the father, and how he views the son 
in the body of Christ because we're supposed to be the vehicle, the body of Jesus Christ, not our own bodies for Jesus Christ. And so that's a completely different emphasis. The emphasis is first on the Father's heart and second on us coming to a place where Christ is formed in us instead of, you know, what we've said before. And then verse 21, it says, um, And the Son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy Son. Um, in this scenario, it wasn't about repentance. Because the Father had already run to him, he'd already kissed him, he'd already uh, seen the son that needed to be in the house. You know, he had, sometimes he has other sons in the house or other daughters instead of the son. And so he, uh, so, so the son, the prodigal son, he's trying to repent and he's trying to get it right and he's trying to, I am not worthy, I'm not this and that, I've failed and everything else. But when the father sees his son in us, he's not seeing failure, especially since Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus has put away all sin, and Jesus will live in us in such a manner that, let's just admit it, it'll take care of sin. But the goal isn't to take care of sin. The goal is to give the father his son. Amen. The goal isn't about what's wrong with me. The goal is what's right with Jesus. The goal isn't to look at me and try to get better. The goal is to, like it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, to look into the face of Jesus. And what do you see there? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You don't even see him because he's not going to declare himself. But you, when you see that, you're changed from glory to glory, from one glory to the other. And it says you're changed into that same image. That image, see. Okay, so if that's true, then the prodigal son is really wasting his time trying to get right. He doesn't need to get right. He, he can't fully get right because it's the son that the father wants. There is no getting right that the father goes, oh, it's just like my son. He's not going to accept just like. He wants his son. See? And so, working on me? No. I get in the word, and I don't look for ways to make me better. I look in the word, and I look for Christ. And I want Jesus, and I want him alive. I want him to be able to live in this vessel and in this body. And I want him to be able to speak his heart. And I want the father to see his son and run and run. I mean, can you imagine? I don't know how old this guy was, but <laughs> the father. But he ran. He ran because it was he saw his son. He didn't see his failure. He didn't say, here's my chief failure. My, this son was my chief failure. And, you know, all, it's, a, it's a, you know, you, you know what a hamster is, right? And you can have a little cage and they have a little wheel and they get in there and they run and they run and that wheel just keeps turning and they never make any progress but they really wear themselves out and they just keep going I'm, oh i know i've gotten somewhere today if there's two of them they're talking and he says how, how many miles did you log today you know how, how far did you go it's not how far it's you know we'll we'll get we'll get on that that wheel of the law and will always try to measure up instead of letting it be according to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all come to that. He gave some apostles, prophets, apostles, pastor teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we all come. That's all supposed to bring us 
all, all ministers, all ministries are supposed to bring us to the measure, not our measure, but the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ in his body. In his body. That's, where he sh that's what he's shooting for. And that's, see, remember we started by saying the, wor um, the father has a particular view of his son that he once formed in us. We, uh, how long did this little repentance thing last? It's like he got it out, but before he was, you know, I mean, he said it all, but the father has already started to acknowledge him with the best. That's what it says. Bring the best robe and the signet ring of the family and the shoes and and that, that is the father acknowledging his son. That's him saying, you're one, prodigal, you're one with that son that I put in you. He's not one with you because we drag him down. We drag him down into junk. And, you know, it's, it's almost like, well, he's so weak. Jesus is so weak. He can't really help me because I'm really messed up. I'm really, really messed up. Well, he's really not messed up, you know. And you can make your choice. It can be about you or it can be about Christ. So, and then verse 22. Um, but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best. It's about coming to the father. It's about coming to the father concerning his son and the father will bring forth his best to you and it'll be all that pertains to Jesus not to us not what we deserve if we get what we deserve we're going to be in hell forever right the Pharisees say well not me no you know but if we receive what belongs to the son then we got we have no room for boasting that's romans one, chapter one all the way through at least five no room for boasting because it's not about us and then then you see the uh, the father bring forth the next thing and bring forth the next thing and the best thing to do is, you know, I, I mean, there's many options here. One is to get puffed up and say, man, I must really be good that he's bringing me the best. The Father has finally figured out how very special I am. And he's blessing me with all of this because I've been faithful. Oh. Or... You know, we can go, no, I don't deserve this, and this is, you're just tormenting me by blessing me and making me feel worse, and da 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 da. Or we can, for the rest of our lives, say, I don't deserve anything. This is coming to me because of the Son, and I give Him all the glory. And my rejoicing is in the Son, not in the grace of God. Okay, now, how much time have I got here? One minute? Okay, so. So there's that contrast again, the grace of God compared to the father honoring his son. We, we look at it as the grace of God, and is the, we, he is a gracious God, but because that's coming to the vessel, through the vessel, to the son. But it's not the grace of God, because first of all, I mean, even if you write that down, Take this out of here. It's going to be more time than I have. Okay. Grace, I'm doing this here. Of God. We said, oh, it was the grace of God. It was the grace of God. Oh, thank God for the grace. Not thank God for God. We're putting our emphasis on what he does instead of who he is. 
And we're missing the heart. We're missing God. We're missing knowing him. We're missing relating to him. And we're relating to things. And it's not even that he is gracious it's in his being. It's this thing was an act of grace. One time event. And I'm giving glory to him there. Okay. But it is God. And it's not even God being gracious. It's God honoring his son. And when we see that, we will quit making got a star. We'll quit making um, acts of God greater than God. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back in a few minutes. Maybe you can tell him. That